Hi, this is Dr. Steven Seiler. One thing I am painfully aware of these days is that I am not 25 anymore, or 35, or 45. In fact, in a few months I'll be 55. But like most of you, I'm still training and still competing occasionally, and so I have the question, do the parts of my or our endurance performance machine all decline at the same rate as we get older. Now, here's some wonderful data. Uh, this is from a guy named Beat Knechtel uh, from Switzerland. He's done some amazing research studies gathering millions of data points from Masters athletes from the New York City Marathon and different sources. So I recommend you go in and find Beat Connectal on Google Scholar if you're interested. This is just one paper that shows cross-sectionally from Masters World Championship data how things decline for both males and females across the adult um, lifespan in people who are training uh, and competing. Uh, and let's face it, things go downhill. But I, I have to say, if, if, if I look like this when I'm competing, if I'm competing at that age, then, then I'm going to be happy with that. But there are reasons why the performance declines, and, and I'm going to try to simplify things by focusing on what I'll call the big three age-related changes that can potentially in, uh, impact endurance performance. The first is one we see if we're paying attention to heart rate over time, and that is maximum heart rate gradually declines as we get older. There's lots of data on this, uh, big cross-sectional studies where you can find, get a lot of data, draw regression lines through the data points, and then you, you develop equations like 220 minus age or something like 208 minus 0.7 times age and so forth. Now, these say something about the population changes, but at the individual level, uh, it's easy to see that they can be very wrong. And so that's why it's still important that you, you know your maximum heart rate. At any rate, it does decline as we get older. Now, another change that occurs is we lose muscle mass. And we preferentially or... or more specifically, tend to lose type 2 or fast fibers more rapidly as we get older. So we lose muscle mass and the relative contribution of slow twitch versus fast twitch to the muscle mass we have kind of changes in the direction of more slow twitch. And you can see this on, on these typical MRI type scans and the typical 25 year old versus the typical 63 year old. You see evidence of muscle atrophy and you tend to see more fat tissue around the muscle. But this is, of course, uh, responsive to training. It doesn't have to be this bad. Uh, we give this a name, sarcopenia from the Latin poverty of flesh. Uh, so that's the scientific term for uh, losing muscle mass as we get older. And here's an example of if you take some 30 year olds, some 50 year olds and some 70 year olds off the street, active, not specifically trained, but active people, in this case, women, uh, you'll see that the compared to the 30-year-olds, the 50-year-olds have a bit less muscle mass or measured as cross-sectional area of the muscle. And then that change accelerates from 50 to 70. So this is 30, 50, and 70 years old, 10 in each group. And if you look at peak force that they can produce, you see the same tendency. So force goes down on pace with how the muscle decreases in size. But what we see is that the force relative to how much muscle you have, it's called force per cross-sectional area, that stays the same. So basically the research suggests that peak force relative to muscle size stays the same 
but uh, we will tend to lose muscle unless we do some significant strength training, particularly once we hit 50, 55 years old. Now the third change that I think a lot of us will feel and, and is it puts us at risk for injury is that we lose tendon elasticity and stiffness. Uh, you're not going to feel this so much on a bike, but for runners, for people who like to play basketball or soccer, uh, this is something that we feel. And I have been on the basketball court and heard both the snap and the yell of a 45-year-old whose Achilles tendon ruptured. And it's not a pretty sight and it's not a pretty sound. Uh, but there are microscopic changes in the tendons that help to explain why this is more prevalent. And it's also made worse by the fact that we just don't train enough uh, that kind of movement. And so then we get on the court occasionally and we're at big risk of uh, a major tendon injury. So uh, some of you may say, well, yeah, but what about mitochondria, Stephen? Those big three, you haven't talked about mitochondria and those are the powerhouses of the aerobic cell. Uh, don't they decline or don't they show any decline in function? And, and uh, yes, there's lots of research on mitochondrial function and aging. In fact, I was even involved in some when I was a PhD student. Um, and here's a recent review just this, <laughs> this month came out with some nice figures but the bottom line seems to be that the mitochondria are very responsive to activity and that if we maintain a high level of aerobic activity, it's really good for our mitochondria They and we can show nice mitochondrial adop, uh, adaptations. And, and we'll see how that plays out uh, in terms of function in a moment. So the question becomes, how much does aging impact the different components of this endurance machinery if we keep training at a similar level, uh, 35, 45, 55, and so forth? So to get at that, we've got to use this model that we've developed over many decades for the basic components of endurance performance, maximum oxygen consumption, fractional utilization, which has many different names like lactate turn point, FTP, MLSS, and so forth, and then work efficiency, which is the translation of the oxygen cost of an activity to how much power or velocity we're able to generate at that degree of metabolic work. And then, of course, you have some anaerobic capacity that plays a role in the in the shorter events. So this is our basic endurance performance model. And then we can look at aging and see how those different components are affected. So there's three research approaches you can use to get at this. One is you can recruit masters athletes, divide them into age groups, and then compare the age groups. Uh, this is a cross-sectional approach and, and uh, on average, what's important is that these different age groups need to be training similarly in terms of volume and use of interval training and so forth uh, to make these comparisons uh, meaningful. Another way would be to recruit masters athletes and then match them with young athletes that are at a similar performance level. For example, master's athlete that can run 40 minutes for a 10 kilometer would be matched with a young athlete that also runs 40 minutes for 10 kilometers. And then you would compare the different physiologies of these two athletes. Uh, in this scenario, the older athletes will be actually better performers, relatively speaking, but it's a way of teasing apart what is happening physiologically. And then the third way uh, would be to find a group of young athletes, say 30 years old, measure them, wait a few decades, or measure them every decade uh, for three decades. And then you would have what's called a longitudinal record of their physiological capacity. This is gold standard, but it's pretty darn challenging to do for obvious reasons. Now, 
in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on these two approaches. I'm going to show you a couple of papers specifically that have used these approaches, uh, and we'll try to make sense of what they seem to be telling us. So the first one is this paper, Physiological Characteristics of Master's Level Cyclists. Now these were male cyclists. Uh, this is by Pfeiffer et al. and uh, Paul Larson, Chris Abbas are names that some of you may be familiar with if you follow the literature. Um, so they have a group of 32 uh, athletes, average age uh, 40, 50, and 65 for the three different cross-sectional groups. And the good thing about this study is that all three of these groups were continuing to train quite regularly, uh, about five days a week for all three groups, and about 10 hours or actually quite a bit more in the oldest group. Their average age was 65, but they were training 15 hours a week. Now, here are the data, VO2 max, peak power output, and so forth, and then shown for the three groups. But this is kind of hard to get your head around because there are lots of numbers. So what I've done is kind of created a table based on these that is a little more simplified. And that's this table. And so these are the data. When they measured VO2 max in the 40-year-olds, their VO2 max was 61. That's quite good. Uh, the 50-year-olds, their VO2 max had was down at 55. Uh, uh, this was cross-sectional again. It's not the same people. And then the 65-year-olds had a VO2 max of 46 on average. And this is the percentage difference relative to the 40-year-olds. Max heart rate was lower in each group as uh, the older age groups as we would expect. But to make a little more sense of these numbers, what I did is I assumed a resting heart rate of 50 and then calculated their resting heart rate, I mean their, excuse me, their heart rate reserve or heart rate range. Uh, and then looked at the decline relative to that heart rate range. Well, when you do that, then you start to see that the drop in heart rate accounts for pretty much or nearly all of the change in VO2 max. Peak power output is also going down. That's the highest power at the, at the end of one of these uh, intermittent tests. And you see that the change in power output is exactly the same as the change in VO2 max in both of the older groups. So that's kind of the bad news is that heart rate goes down and if heart rate is going down that means cardiac output is going down because stroke volume is not going to fully compensate and so we are not able to deliver as much oxygen to the working muscle uh, at, at maximum heart rate. But there's good news too. Economy, uh, the basically the efficiency of translating that metabolic power to external power, that stays pretty much the same or it sh based on this study. And then there's even more good news in the sense that if you look at the thresholds, here they measured VT1, the first ventilatory threshold, and VT2, the second ventilatory threshold, and then expressed it as a percentage of their VO2 max. Well, when you do that, the 40-year-olds are hitting their VT1 at 66% of VO2 max, and that's about 40 mLs per kg. The 50-year-olds are hitting now at 73% of their lower VT uh, or lower uh, VO2 max, and that's exactly the same 40 mLs per kg. And then the 65-year-olds, they're actually hitting their second uh, or their uh, VT1 at 82% of their lower VO2 max. So relative to their max, these <laughs> older athletes are actually, they have a higher threshold. And what that ends up doing is, is that the, at this low intensity threshold, that first lactate turn point, they are about the same, uh, only about a 5% decrease from 40 to 65 in this group. And then VT2, you see the same tendency that they're relatively higher, and then the, the decline is relatively smaller 
compared to the decline in VO2 max. So submaximal or peripheral capacity is being preserved quite well with age, but central capacity is declining. Now here's another study. This one is on runners. Uh, Andrew Coggin was the lead author here. Many of you have heard of Andy Coggin based on his work on using power uh, in cycling and as a measure of uh, intensity zones. In this study, they used that second approach where they identified master's athletes and knew their 10 kilometer time and then matched them athlete for athlete with a younger runner who had basically the same 10K performance record or personal record. Um, there was eight masters athletes, eight performance matched runners. And then in addition, they added a third group of uh, control young runners that had a, a, a higher or a faster 10K PB uh, just as a reference. Now, if you look at some of the data, I'll highlight one, the typical things you see is uh, master versus younger. They'll tend to be a bit more body fat, a bit less muscle mass for reasons that we mentioned earlier. Uh, VO2 max, what do you see? Well, the VO2 max of the master's athletes is lower, as we would expect, about 11 to 12 percent lower. Heart rate max is lower by a similar amount. Uh, but remember, they're, these two groups are running at the same speed. Uh, they're matched person for person. So, how's that happening? Well, when we look at the muscle adaptations, we see that the master athletes, relative to their matched young trained, have higher capillary density, uh, it measured in different ways, and they have higher densities of these mitochondrial enzymes that are associated with uh, high aerobic metabolism, high fat oxidation. So you can basically say that the master's athletes that are matched for performance with the young uh, trained have better peripheral adaptations relative to the young athletes and they are compensating for their lower central capacity, their lower VO2 max with, uh, relatively speaking, uh, better uh, skeletal muscle adaptations. But if you compare them with the higher performers across the board, then you see that they are not at the same level as the athletes that are running 33 minute 10 Ks. And that makes sense. That's how we would expect. So these are the take home messages. One, maximum oxygen consumption does decline with age, and that's mostly because maximum heart rate declines. We can't do much about that. We lose muscle explosiveness, we lose muscle mass, and preferentially we lose the fast twitch fibers. We can do something about that with strength training, but probably can't prevent it completely. But muscle endurance is well maintained if we keep training. And therefore, our maximum endurance capacity declines faster than you might call our submaximal capacity. And so this is going to mean that we're tending to perform relatively better or declining slower in those longer races. And, and we match up better with our younger teammates on longer, low intensity training sessions as we age at least in this age range of 35 to 65. So that's the story for today. And here are some research articles you can dig into if you want to learn more. Thanks.